Welcome to TMZ Live. Harvey Levin here. Charles here. So, uh, Sydney Sweeney is maybe the hottest actress out there right now. Um, everybody wants Sydney Sweeney. You mean hot as in relevance and career choices and opportunities, all, right? All of the above and more. <laughs> all of the above and more. So, um, imagine our surprise when we came into the office today and we saw this. There is a woman who is a very accomplished uh, producer. producer. Um, who is also a professor at the USC uh, Film School, which uh -huh. is the best film school in the country. Sure. She said some pretty damn harsh things. Yeah. Uh, Carol Baum was uh, actually talking to a New York Times film critic, and the subject of Sydney Sweeney came up. Carol said, there's an actress who everybody loves now, Sydney Sweeney. I watched this unwatchable movie, sorry to people who love this movie, this romantic comedy where they hate each other. Explain this girl to me. She's not pretty. She can't act. Why is she so hot? So she not only said this to the New York Times film critic, she then spoke to her class at right. USC. This was a discussion actually in front of her class with uh, the New York Times film critic. There. And asked yeah. the class, hey, why is this? What's the deal? Yeah, what's the deal with Sydney Sweeney? Now, Sydney Sweeney's rep has now responded to this very harshly and um, expectedly. Harshly, yes. And this is what her rep said. How sad that a woman in the position to share her expertise and experience chooses instead to attack another woman. If that's what she's learned in her decades in the industry, that's shameful. To unjustly disparage a fellow female producer speaks volumes about Miss Baum's character. So I want to... By the way, she was pointing out there that Sydney is not just an actress, she's also producing them. Now, but I want to distinguish something from something else. Um, there were two criticisms uh, that Baum had. There one were, was, but one, I think, I, I know. negates the other. Well, no, 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 I don't think it does. One is that she no. can't act, and the other is that she's not pretty. Right. Now, and if I, you just said she can't act, we wouldn't even be talking about this. Right. And that's why I'm saying, when, as soon as Carol decided to say she's not pretty, well, now... It just sounds like you have uh, a personal beef with her. I disagree. And I mean, I, 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 and now I can't take her seriously when she says she can't act. Well, the, 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 by the way, Carol Baum is an, a, a very accomplished producer. Sure. She did Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Um, she did Father of the Bride. So right. she's very accomplished. I think it is fair criticism. I, I think, it is. Well, hold on. I, I agree with you. I think it's outrageous that she would say, oh, she's not pretty. That's so gratuitous. This and is just like the Lawrence Sanchez thing yesterday. Right. It's just, right. it's ridiculous. But making a comment about somebody's acting. acting abilities, I happen to disagree with that. I think Sydney Sweeney is a great actress, but making that comment is fair, is fair game. It, it is absolutely it is fair, fair game. game if that's all you said. But because she did said the other thing, so you won't listen to anything because you disagree with right. half of it. Because I, because yeah, I think ridiculous. she just has a personal. Because she just has a personal. Uh, well, well, how I do don't you know, know she has a personal thing? Because why would anybody, if you're going to... She's you start, 81 years old, Charles. And, it's you a start, and, and your first thing is that she's not pretty. Come on. It was the last thing she said. If you're speaking as a producer and you say that she, I feel she can't act... So you're not going to listen to her. Fine. You're not going to listen to her at all. The woman has the way, been in show way, business for decades. I actually understand Carol's criticism of her acting, in my opinion, that, yeah, she's not the most polished actor at this point. I think she's a great actress, but... but I, that's fair. By the way, Carol is having mega regrets about even saying all this because we spoke to her this morning and she said that she is having regrets. She's getting bombarded with hate mail. Um, and she said that speaking like this about another woman, it's just not her style. So she didn't say she was sorry, but I mean, I, I think you could see the tea leaves here that, that she is unhappy that she said that, but also probably apologize. I, 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 I don't, said yeah, but I, don't, I also don't understand how she could, like, th th somehow got away from her that she said it. That was a very <laughs> intentional comment. Right. That was a very intentional comment. But I don't understand how you can do that. You can't dismiss somebody because you disagree with half of what yes, they again, say. The way you said it, the way you say it matters. I and agree the way with it you. came out makes me just think that she's just got some personal beef with Sydney Sweeney. Why would she reason. have personal she I don't know, maybe Sydney Sweeney turned her down for a movie that she wanted her in. She watched the movie on an airplane and was just I making... I know, but my point is, I, because you first assailed her looks, now no, was, I don't believe you... You last go assailed back, her looks. Go back to go it. Back, go, let me, let's see let, the quote. Let's see the quote again. Quote. One more it time. It doesn't matter what order it's I know, in, really. but you said it, so... To she's the, not pretty. There it is. Okay, you were right on that. Yeah, you were okay. right on that.
Okay. <laughs> and it's ridiculous to say she's not pretty. I agree with you. It's just like the Lauren Sanchez thing. But, you know, I, I don't know. Look, can't you just Stop attacking someone's looks I, if can, you want to talk about their talent. What I hate about this is this is what happens in America. Either you, you are in this box or you're in this box. Some people, you disagree with some things and you agree with some things. And it's like you can't just dismiss her. I get what you're saying, but she's not interacted with Sydney Sweeney or had a movie with her. I mean, come Maybe on. Maybe she wanted to have a movie with her and, and Sydney turned her down. Hey, this is Darren Green. I'm in New Jersey. Carol is giving boomer vibes, okay? I thought <laughs> her comment. Okay, oh, I'm taking and offense to that. And that's accurate, by I'm the way. I'm taking offense that to that. That is accurate. <laughs> I thought that her car, her comments that she made about Sydney Sweeney was very harsh. I think that a lot of people overlook that this actress, you know, because of her appearance and because she plays a lot of dumb blonde roles, you know, people overlook that, you know, she has a she has a range and she received two Emmy nominations. For euphoria. I mean, and she is pretty. She is. I don't know what she was talking about. So I'm Team Sydney Sweeney. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, right. I think there are certain people who are objectively good looking. She happens to be one of them, I think. That's my opinion. But um, everybody is subjective. Okay. So Everybody. This, this, we're going we're gonna to move on. This next thing is fascinating, what Bill Maher did. Uh, fascinating. Yes. Bill Maher uh, sat down with Katie Couric and ended up defending Woody Allen. Um, and in particular, he took issue with... And going after actors. Yes, actors who have come out and said that they regret making movies with Woody Allen because of the allegations against him uh, from his ex, uh, Mia Farrow, and also Ronan Farrow and Dylan Farrow. They've all come out against uh, Woody Allen. But this is what Bill Maher had to say about this. Uh, how did they get on the subject of Woody Allen? Bill, his... his I know, it goes... It's, they very, talk about it's very expansive, which I love about yes. this podcast. It's Club Random. So here's a little bit of what went down. I don't think he committed that crime, that there was two police investigations that exonerated him. I mean, like, what do you have to do in this country? You know, this these all these actors who won't work with him anymore, some of them made movies with him, and I, I regret doing that. What a bunch of... Okay, he's, first of all, it's a very improbable crime that they're accusing him of. If you saw the documentary about it, it was all from her point of view. So first of all, I just flat out believe him. I believe a 57-year-old man didn't suddenly become a child molester in the middle of a divorce proceeding in a custody battle in a house full of adults in broad daylight. I don't I know. I definitely don't but know. But there was some pretty sketchy and damning things in that documentary that were separate from just Mia Farrow, you know, that wanting his girlfriend to dress up in little anklets and Mary Janes and baby doll dresses. Do you mean, think he's the only guy who likes that? <laughs> really? You think know. he's the first guy who wanted his girlfriend to dress in anklets and baby doll? A uh, couple things about this. One, it, it's I'm not surprised Bill Maher's defending Woody Allen. He's on the anti-cancel train, obviously. We know that, that about Bill. Uh, but to the specific point about Woody Allen, I know Woody Allen got swept up in the Me Too stuff and all the Dylan Farrow stuff got resurfaced. By the way, that Dylan Farrow saga is decades old. It happened so long ago. It was in the public spotlight back then and all of a sudden got kind of brought back up again with this whole HBO documentary and a whole new generation learned about it and that's when he got kind of got re-canceled again. Um, look, honestly, in terms of like believing Woody Allen, et cetera, that's Bill's prerogative. Um, I, I do think that there's something to the fact that Woody Allen was investigated over this and he was sort of exonerated at the time. They, they, the, the police found no there there. Um, with that said, though, it's not 1975 anymore, and Woody Allen's not this hot director that everyone's rushing to work with. So I feel like there's there's a few things that are true here. Like, yes, he's sort of being maybe unfairly canceled in some regard, but by the same but token, he might not he's be not, working he's that not much this, anyway. He's not, right? you know he's what I mean? Like, it's not, something. we're not talk, making Annie Hall anymore. Like, it's Woody Allen's aesthetic and his whole juice is long, long gone. It's just, it just is. I, I, I agree with most of what you said, Fabian, but I don't think Bill's point was to you know, say I'm defending Woody Allen, although he is. I think his point was to talk about all of these actors who are hand wringing and saying, "Oh my God, I I, I and regret it working be enough that so there I was an that, investigation I think that's, and he was clear." And I think that's what he was getting at more than he was whether Woody Allen did or didn't right, do that it. Right, back because they were only backpedaling because of the re-cancellation, as you mentioned, Fabian. Yeah, I mean, yes, to Harvey's point, that's right. He, he's kind of going after the actors who are doing the hand-wringing and kind of like now backing away when it's convenient to do so. But he is, in the same, in the same breath, saying, I actually believe Woody Allen and kind of dying on right. that hill, which is fine. 
Um, I, I don't know. The other thing that's that wor that's working against Woody Allen is the fact that he kind of has this little bit of a creepo image. He looks kind of creepy. He married his stepdaughter. That is that's not helping him. There is that. It's 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 murky. I I, I don't know. Hello, I'm Lisa Perron from Thunder Bay, Ontario, Canada. Bill Maher is known for his edgy commentary, and he's entitled to his opinion. However, I think celebrities who don't want to work with him or boycott him or regret working with him probably remember, like I do, the very controversial relationship he had with his partner's daughter, someone who he was a father figure to for over 10 years. And that speaks volumes to me about his character. I don't blame him at all for not wanting to work with him or being regretful. By the yeah, way, I mean, still has that relationship with her. He's still married. They're they're, married. They've been married for decades. Yeah. But fair point, though, that a lot of people were really creeped out and upset by right. what happened there. Okay, taking a break. All right, when we come back, Riley Strain's parents speaking out about his fraternity brothers, how they reacted after his disappearance, and something they did that really, really rubbed them the wrong way while they were still searching for Riley. Well, Riley Strain's parents have made it clear that they don't believe that he uh, simply, you know, accidentally drowned, accidentally in fell the, into the river, yeah. and that's how he drowned. Uh, they've ordered another uh, autopsy, and there are uh, and there are some questions about what happened that night. Some real questions. Right now, aside from the questions about what happened that night, they're also really upset at Riley's fraternity brothers, the people that he was out with that night in Nashville. Um, and how they reacted immediately after his disappearance and even hours later. Uh, they sat down with News Nation and revealed some things that we really had never heard before uh, about the fraternity brothers in the hours after his disappearance. The fraternity brothers had not gone to the police when they called you? Not that I am aware of. Were you surprised? Yes. Mm hmm because why wouldn't they? When we got there, all the boys were out, well, not all the boys, but several of the boys were out front with a police officer. And then um, they all of a sudden disappeared, all of the boys. And um, they ended up back out a little while, a while later in their dress clothes to go out to their formal that night. They went to the formal? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We spent the next four, four and a half hours searching every emergency room to see if he was in the hospital. We come back and they're coming back, some of them from the party and they're waving at us as we're sitting in the truck. How's that make you feel? That is really, really shocking, but it just adds another layer to this mystery because remember, Riley was in Luke Bryan's bar in Nashville and he was kicked out. Now, we're we still don't know, and this is several months later now, we don't know why he was kicked out. Um, or we he haven't had, seen why he was kicked out. We haven't they heard. Said, the bar said that he was uh, violating their code right. of conduct. What does that mean? Right. We don't know right. what he was doing in that bar that caused him to get kicked out. It has been radio silent by Luke Bryant, by his bar, and by the fraternity brothers. They haven't said he had one drink and two waters, and that drink tasted funny to him. At that bar, him. that's the only, right. only thing that was on the tab. And when you look at this video of him leaving, he is just totally out of it. And so the fraternity brothers let him leave in that state, and then you and heard I the parents. I totally get why the parents oh, my, are, are upset about the outraged. fact that while he's gone, <laughs> you know. I don't know where the legal liability is, and we're going to have to find that out through further investigation. But what those fraternity brothers did, letting their friend, their brother, leave the bar, walk off on his own in that state, and then continue to party, and yeah. then go out that night to a formal, it is uh, incomprehensible it's to so me. It's so weird that they, they had the wherewithal. They called Riley's parents. Because but, they were concerned enough. Concerned enough to call his parents, and they had a conversation with the police, but then decided that, eh, we'll go to the dance. We'll go to the formal. It's really outrageous. Um, it, I get why the parents are upset about it. And that, again, that's not to say that any of them had anything to do with Riley's disappearance. But they could have protected him. And, yes. and that's and, what and the that's, parents And are that's saying. what the parents right. are saying. Yeah, I, I, at some point, right, we take on the, uh, the obligation to, to take care of somebody when they real, we realize they're in trouble and we went with them. I don't know exactly what's gonna come out in this, but I, I wouldn't rule out the possibility of some sort of liability for these kids. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if there's gonna be liability, but I will tell you, I've done a lot of research on this case. My spidey senses are up that something happened um, with with Riley Strain, that is not the way the police have said. It's just.
the way things work in this world these days, when you've got a bunch of people at a bar, young people, they like clout, yet nobody's talking, nobody's saying what happened in the yep. bar, nobody's saying why he was kicked out, the bar's not saying why he's kicked out, family couldn't get the surveillance video inside the bar. Something is up with this case, and you just feel the heartache from the parents yep. listening to that. I'm Shantiana Keys from Atlanta, and I, I agree. It's completely understandable that parents would want information after such a mysterious outcome and, and death. And it's strange that fraternity brothers wouldn't be more concerned about their friend. I mean, it's called a brotherhood, and you, you still see that they waited so long to call the police. And um, even when the parents came to town, to not show more concern. And so to go to a formal a day later, I think it's just absolutely wild. And I think the parents, rightfully so, are pursuing more information and suspicious of their involvement. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, we are gonna move on. Yes, uh, to Zendaya speaking out about something that uh, a lot of her fans are really anxious to hear about. When is Euphoria coming back for its third season? Uh, or H is it? Or is it, yeah, because HBO recently announced that they uh, are postponing filming the third season. Again, this is, I think, the second or third time they've postponed it. Um, and, but they said they are committed to doing it at some point. Well, as it turns out, Zendaya had an event here in Hollywood for another one of her projects. And while she was walking in, she was asked, what's going on with Euphoria? Keep in mind that she is also uh, credited as an executive producer. So you would think she has some knowledge about what's going on behind the scenes. You would think. But listen to uh, her, her reaction here. Euphoria, will we see its third season? I, I, I don't know. I am, I, am, I am not in charge. But, but you want it. But of course, I, you know, I, I, if it's right for the characters and everything turns out the way it should, of course, but it's, it's, it's beyond me. Well, isn't it ironic that the overwhelming success of this show has now created a problem for HBO? I, I mean, the issue is that there are so many stars on this show that they can't rally everyone together at once. You have Zendaya, Hunter Schaefer, Jacob Elordi, Storm Reid. I mean, the list goes on and on. And all of Sydney these- Sweeney. Sweeney Sweeney. Sydney Sweeney, who's done three <laughs> huge movies in the past six months. It's just impossible to get everyone together. Well, and so is that, what, is that what the issue is? I that don't they think just that's, can't get the staff together. That's definitely what-, a, what, what a part of the problem is and who knows what else is going on but yeah it's gotten too big for its own good you know what else it might be what paying that that they're negotiating with different their uh, price points have i mean sydney sweeney zendaya yeah but they're, they're probably all locked in already um this is the way hollywood works that somebody i mean you've seen this a million it times you also they had a death in the cast but i think it's all of that together yeah it's probably a combination of all of it but boy she was like, I don't know. I don't know. Don't ask me. I don't know <laughs> nothing. My name is Ben. I'm from Detroit. Um, so I think the show should just end. Uh, it's been a good two seasons uh, with the unfortunate death of Angus uh, Clow, with the many delays and with the weirdness going behind director Sam Levinson with the weekend show last year. I just think it's better to just end it. Um, let those stars do what they're going to do. They're all successful. They have all amazing other projects going on. So just end it on a high note and yeah, move on. Boy, this is like um, The Breakfast Club, kind of, where everybody on that cast became Went big on, stars. Um, the euphoria of Everyone feels, is, yeah. You know, and kind of feels. They cast well. Yeah. Uh, taking a break. <laughs> All right. When we come back, a, an absolutely shocking scam that turned deadly in Ohio. And what happened with this elderly man, 81 years old, could happen to anybody, and in fact does. Now, this one was weird that it turned deadly, but what do you do when you get a strange phone call? What should you do? We're gonna be joined by a tech expert who is gonna have some tips for you. You really gotta look out for AI to getting involved in this. I don't wanna be alarmist and say you should not answer your phone, but it's starting to feel like you can't answer your phone unless you know exactly who the person is. Uh, That's scams, where a lot of people work these scams these have gotten so elaborate and involving multiple people now, um, not just you if you pick up the phone. There's a, a, a case in Ohio that just happened that is really terrifying. Um, a, an elderly man was called and said that you need to give us $12,000, otherwise we are going to kill your relative that was jailed, or that was, what, that was the story they told. Then they call an Uber driver and tell the Uber driver, you're gonna go to this guy's house. And pick something up. Pick something up. So poor Lolita has no idea what she's stepping into, and she arrives, 
and she had a dash uh, dash cam that was recording this interaction between herself and the victim of this scam, and it turned into a deadly confrontation. Yes. Yeah, I know what you're after. You're after the... Help! 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 Well, oh my God, it, it just... Malitha ended up dying. William Brock has been arrested. He's 81 years old. Oh, it is just heartbreaking. All because of this scam that wasn't really happening. He didn't have a relative that was, but this is what these scammers do. They prey on the elderly and they put out these fantastical scenarios. It happened to one of his relatives. Yeah, uh, where someone called and said that, um, you know, I was in jail, we need $10,000. Um, and luckily, someone told her at the last minute, that sounds like a scam, because she was ready to send the $10,000. What do you do about this? Um, and AI is actually making this worse when you get these phone calls. Uh, joining us now to talk about the latest scams you should be looking out for and what you can do, Lance Ulanoff is the uh, editor at Tech Radar, and he is joining us right now. Lance, welcome to TMZ Live. Thanks for having me. So, Lance, these calls, which were first annoying and then became so risky just in terms of your bank account, uh, have now become deadly. So does what we just saw empower these people who are up to no good, or does it dissuade them? Well, look, I, I can't see into their minds. I, this is not, obviously, their goal is not for anyone to be killed. This is absolutely tragic. But their goal is to get money, and they use it's often a coordinated effort. But here's the thing that you have to understand. They're starting with all of this information that they have about you, because we have been dropping this information about our personal lives, about our details on social media for almost 20 years now. There is so much information. So every time you get one of these calls, it seems very real because they know so much about you. You know, they probably knew a lot about the nephew, and it was easy to convince, you know, this this 81-year-old man of what was going on. And, of course, in the case of now AI, they can actually replicate some voices, so they really can make it quite convincing. So, in other words, he could have heard his nephew's voice saying, help, please give him the money. He could have. Now, I don't know that he did, and they may not have, you know, the thing is, they don't even need to go that far. They just need a few details that make it sound completely real. And the thing is, they operate on your fear and confusion. They're telling you have to act now. And this goes anywhere from something as, as you know, important and dangerous as that to your bank account, to a package that's sitting on your front lawn, to your Social Security account has been hacked, or your, you know, there's money that you owe. There's a, you know, Amazon, you owe money to Amazon, and it sounds like Amazon. It says it's Amazon, but it's not. So they are working at many levels, always with the goal, the aim of getting your money. But if you act immediately on those calls, on those texts, that's how they get you, because the, your fear and confusion is their fuel. Hmm. Lance, so how are they getting all this information? Like in the case of William Brock, how they're just combing the internet for any connections to a target? So they decide they want to target William Brock, and then they just go searching for all his relatives and find whatever they can. Exactly. You can start on the dark web, right? A lot of our information has been hacked and, and leaked onto the dark web, lots of it, including social security numbers. So they might start with that, and then they're going to look on social media, and they're going to try and connect the dots. They're going to do some triangul triangulation, because what they really want is multiple actors, right? They want a victim, a possible victim that they can identify, you know, whether, you know, where does he go to school? What does he do for a living? What's his middle name? Anything. And then who are his relatives and who are the relatives who might be the easiest target? So what do you tell your, you know, elderly relative about phone calls, about text messages? Um, do this ignore everything? Look, it's hard to ignore everything because also you get texts, right? They just show up and you look down and you see in all caps that there's a problem with your bank account, right? And it, it, it works on a sort of a psychological level. You, your blood pressure rises. You think, I have to act. 
my first word of advice for my relatives, my friends, my family is always stop. Wait a moment. Do not act immediately because that is always the beginning of a big problem. So, you know, when it's an official sounding source, you go directly to the source. You never use, because a lot of times they'll give you a phone number. Let's say we're with the FBI, with the CIA, with Social Security. Call this number. And then you call the number. It all seems real. Don't use the number they called. Mm. You look up a real number. You talk to a friend. How do I contact these people? So you always want to go directly to the source. Never trust who is texting you, who is calling you. So last thing, you're in the tech world. Have you read, uh, I'm just curious, have you read Kara Swisher's book, Burn Book? I have not read it yet. I know Kara, and Kara's a brilliant woman, uh, and she knows a lot of stuff. I got to <laughs> tell you, I got to tell you, it's one of the best books I have read in years. It is fantastic. Read that book. It's so good. I'm serious. Yeah, well, I mean, look, I've, I've lived some of that book, but I will yeah. be happy to. <laughs> it's really, really good. I'm just, I, 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 I love it. And her writing is just magnificent. It's so good. She's, she's really great. Lance, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, that's very valuable information that, uh, that everybody can use, or at least someone they know can use. So thank you, um, Lance. Appreciate it. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Okay, we're gonna take a break. All right, when we come back, Taylor Swift has them lining up in LA. I mean, people waiting five hours, not to see her, she's not there, but something connected to her, related to her new album coming out this week is there, and you're gonna see why people waited, I cannot believe this, for five hours. Welcome back to TMZ Live. Uh, Taylor Swift's new album comes out uh, on Friday, the Tortured Poets Department. You might want to change the title to Tortured Fans. No. Because <laughs> they're not what, tortured. They're in. I guess it. they don't feel they don't like feel tortured. tortured. We're just tortured watching. It looks like torture to me. There is an event that's going down here in LA. By the way, they're not waiting for Taylor Swift. They're waiting for a couple of books. Yeah, on a shelf. and by the way, they knew that Taylor Swift wasn't there. This but is a five-hour long line. Uh, this is a pop-up event at the Grove uh, Outdoor Mall here in LA. Same Grove. And this is what they were waiting for. This sort of, it's just like a, I don't know what you call it. It's, it's a pop-up <laughs> library and it's highly curated to represent the theme of the new album. So of course there's a ton of Easter eggs at this place and all the Swifties, they love uncovering this kind of stuff. So Charlie, explain for people who are not Swifties um, that Taylor does this with all of her albums, right? There are Which little is an album hints. coming out Friday. This right. album's coming With the album coming out Friday, so she drops these little hints so, like, what are, yeah, so when like you get up to that, that, that library, what do you get? The theme. So, for example, like, one of the things there is a glass jar that has a bunch of puzzle pieces in it. And apparently this puzzle, fans have discovered, is a Brogmian's puzzle. And the puzzle is called The Lines, which apparently is the hardest puzzle to solve. I am out. And, and what, and what saying, does that tell me about? Uh, so who? it's a puzzle that can't be put together. So they're basically saying that Taylor's relationship with Joe, because this album is about Joe, oh her God. relationship with him was too hard to solve, too hard to fix. Um, there's also other small things like there's a there's a bird cage, but the bird cage door is open and the bird is on the outside. So it's like the bird was freed. And uh -huh. then you know there's things like there's a Who's the bird. With, oh, she's the, she's the bird. No, she's the bird. The bird. Well, she's why can't Joe be the bird? Dude, do you really want to get into this? I know, Charles. Come on, this is her album, not his. There's also um, a vase of dried flowers. There's like lavender and there's Cornelia rose. Okay, okay, we're gonna stop right here. <laughs> enough, enough. <laughs> okay, but we got I, it. I will say, oh my I mean, all that to me is ridiculous. But, but there you, were but you five cannot, hour line, a right. five hour line. But you can't deny that her fans care. This no, time. they by do. The way, and look at the people online. It's not. It's, what are you saying? It's a wide spectrum <laughs> of people. It's not just what like teenage girls as people. Think that that's oh true. Taylor Swift's fans are all these that's true crazy teenage girls. Oh, look, I like There's Taylor a lot Swift, of adults over there. But my God, it's a five-hour line to look for these clues about what we all know, which is she had a relationship that didn't work out. And I just don't get it. I don't get it. But and the reason I don't get it is I've stood in one of those five-hour lines, not for Taylor Swift. For what? And not uh, what, what would I make you stand to... in a five-hour line? I took my mother to Memphis. We went to Graceland and there was a line to get in for a vigil to walk around his grave. 
Oh, that's, I, oh no. But, I know what the, but I know what the grave looks like. And I'm standing in line I, with this candle and I'm going, why am I standing I here? I kind of get that because it's paying, it's an homage to Elvis. And I kind of get that, although I would never stand in front of line. Can I tell you what was the really, really awful part of standing in that line? What? Aside from just the five hours. Somebody had guessed. waiting and you walk through, you get walk through the house and you walk through the, we waited five hours, but I had booked a VIP tour the next day and we did all of that without waiting. Oh. So there was no reason <laughs> at all to wait for five hours. <laughs> okay, you're Hope dumb. You enjoyed it, Mom. You're dumb. <laughs> Melissa Pascal from London, UK. Taylor Swift will always have people hanging off her every word, myself included. But I think people are excited for this album in particular just because of the links to the breakup with Joe Alwyn, which is pretty much still a mystery to the public, the reasons why. Is it so really? Is it? And do they care? Like, she's I moved thought, on. I thought the she's whole... She's moved on, yeah, I no, thought no, the fans have moved on. I know. I mean, I thought the whole thing was he wouldn't marry her and she wanted to get married and she said, I'm done with this, right? I mean, well, am I wrong? More than I do. Am I wrong? I, I feel like there must be more to it. I feel like we need to read between the lines of the lyric. Or, yeah. Well. Joe Elwin should come out with an album. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, we gotta move on. Yes, uh, to Caitlin Clark and the White House um, because President Biden has now weighed in on Caitlin Clark's WNBA salary. We told you she was drafted number one, as everyone expected, by the Indiana Fever, and then everyone saw what her pay scale is, which has been out there before, but certainly highlighted because of the draft, that she's basically gonna be making around $75,000 a year for the next four years. Well, the White House decided that they wanted to weigh in on this, and I have some very clear opinions about why, but of course uh, you women in why. sports <laughs> women in sports continue to push new boundaries and inspire us all but right now we're seeing that even if you're the best women are not paid their fair share it's time that we give our daughters the same opportunities as our sons and ensure women are paid what they deserve without getting any spe without getting specific this was a campaign speech this, it's giving election it's campaign year. speech it's giving it's election pandering. year <laughs> oh I, i've been i have been dying to get on here and to talk about this <laughs> <laughs> I am, it, it's, it's absurd. First of all, the reason that we are talking about Caitlin Clark and it's a story and we've put up 10 stories on the website about it is because this is something that's never happened before. So if in a couple of years, the people actually watch the WNBA games and the TV contracts are elevated and then the women don't get paid more, then I will be right up on here and I'll be the first person to say it's absurd. But the bottom line is that the right, NBA the, the, makes- The pay scale is- the yes. pay scale is what it is now because right. the WNBA Charles, the does not have, have their, their, their audience. They're not, they're not getting the licensing fees that that that, that the NBA that does. the uh, NBA Herbie, gets. You're talking about ten billion plus dollars in revenue versus maybe a hundred million dollars for the WNBA. The reality is they're fantastic athletes, but the reality is there's not an audience for it. Well, there and is the now. NBA, they're, now they're, they're, and now there maybe, is. Now, so I mean, maybe she's not played she hasn't a single played. Game maybe yet, though, is the maybe. Reality. But the, but the fact is that. If uh, Babcock, I think you nailed it. That 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 at this point, if the licensing deals from broadcast networks go up because the audience is there, and you know, and if they're filling stediums, yep. then they absolutely then need. Then they got a case. Then they right. then they got they well, got a they the got a compelling here? case. A that, compelling case. Uh, what is the expectation from the president that 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 the NBA should just float all of these contracts and and. The expectation is the all those angry Caitlin Clark fans, they want them to feel like, hey, we're on your side because it's election year. Yeah, but it's and everybody year. wants to yeah. be right. Boy, wouldn't they love to have a Caitlin Clark uh, endorsement? Oh, they would love a Caitlin Clark endorsement for yeah. sure. <laughs> I mean, look, it, it, everything is politics these days. I mean, everything is politics. And by the way, I'm not saying this against Biden. I think no. And by the way, Donald if, Trump does. If there was this, a Republican in the White House, they would have said the same exact thing. Of course, they would have done the thing. same thing. Right. Of course. Okay, we got to take a break. All right. When we come back, uh, Jason Kelsey lost something very, very valuable on a day super valuable, super valuable indeed. On a day when they were being celebrated at their alma mater, he ended up losing. I don't know how this happened, but he says there's a large bowl of chili to blame. Uh, the Kelsey brother hijinks continue, although I don't know that they're gonna be really laughing about this one. Jason, we showed you uh, last week, Jason and Travis went back to the University of Cincinnati and they were celebrated there. They actually got to get their diplomas because they didn't get to walk when Chuck's they graduated. Chuck's beer on the way. Yeah, well, there was something else that happened. We didn't actually cover this because it was just, wasn't consequential. Now it is. Um, there was a, a chili bowl fight 
search or something. The game was they hid Jason's Super Bowl ring in a sock and put it in this big vat of chili. And the competition was you had to try and find it. Now, the competitors can, can, ended up can, can I stop you for a second? throwing chili. Are we paying for their student loans? <laughs> I just want to know this. Are those the students are we whose paying loans for that? are being forgiven? Go on. Anyway, so Jason, uh, here's, he's now, he's revealing the outcome. They never found, the competitors never found the sock, and therefore never found the Super Bowl ring. And apparently, Jason never found it either before Lost he left campus. Super Bowl ring. There was an unfortunateness, uh, as you guys know, the, this game existed because I continually lose my Super Bowl ring. Um, and I don't even know if Travis still knows this, uh, but I legitimately lost my Super Bowl ring in this event. We have still yet to find it. All of this stuff has been thrown away, so I think we can safely assume that my Super Bowl ring is now in a landfill uh, someplace in the Cincinnati tri-state tri area. I didn't think that would happen. What did you expect to happen? I thought that we would just go in the pool and get the ring afterwards, but they You're were throwing such and missile. there was so much Jason. calamity happening that at some point, I, the only thing I can think of is at some point the sock got kicked out of the, the three-way and it made its way out of the pool and that it was thrown away in some shape or form. I don't understand how, I mean, even Travis is like, it was like, listen, man, I, I know we're not, <laughs> this is dumb even for you. What do you, like, how do you walk away from that event and go like, hang on, before we leave everyone, where is my ring? The reality is, is Jason, straight up didn't really care though. He went on to explain that he just thinks it's a hunk of metal and he's he's kind of yeah. lost it before and it's not a huge deal to him. He said he's gonna file an insurance claim and just get a new one made. So while we think it's a huge deal because it's a 50, 60, 70 thousand dollar ring, he clearly doesn't care. But well he, then he, that means he's got a lot of money because that ring is sure. worth that kind of money. Sure. And, and it's the original ring that he got. So whoever ends up, is, By it, way, is it in a landfill? Years from some, now it's gonna pop up online someone right. selling it. Was it in a landfill or did somebody take the ring then? Someone had of to have course. taken it. Of course. Because if you're there and you're cleaning up and you know that the competitors right. didn't find it, right. well then you're gonna find the like, Look what I got today yeah. at work. <laughs> I'm serious. Wow. Jeez. Hey guys, it's Ben from Dallas. Let's be honest, this is a total Kelsey move. I mean, who else would lose a Super Bowl ring in Chile? I mean, if you think about it, that's only a Kelsey move. It does seem like a Kelsey move. What is the tuition there, by the way? I just want to know. <laughs> just want to know how much <laughs> just wanna know. loan forgiveness is <gasps> happening. Okay, we're taking a break. All right. Uh, <laughs> uh, when we come back, this is really exciting for Beatles fans. Lennon and McCartney, reborn, sort of. <laughs> yes, there is a new Lennon and McCartney song, and I really wonder what Paul thinks of this. You're going to hear it when we come back. This could have happened years Decades ago, and I'm not sure why it didn't. Lennon and McCartney, uh, the most legendary songwriting duo in all of rock and roll, they have a reboot, if you will, because Paul McCartney's son and John Lennon's son have recorded a song together. They wrote a song, it's called Primrose Hill. It's Sean Lennon and James McCartney. And by the way, take a look at them. They look like their dads. Yes, in they definitely. In a big way. They look like them, but the question is, do they sound like them? Do they write like them? Hmm. Here's the song, Primrose Hill. We laid on Primrose Hill Didn't know it still You meant what you said An overcast, sultry day I didn't know what to do I didn't know what to say I hear John. I really hear hmm. John there. Wow, yeah. that was shocking. They, yeah. the I hear like John. Primrose Hill sounds like Penny Lane or Fool on the Hill. Like it's got like lyrically yeah. kind of yeah. is evocative of them. This is cool they're doing this, but honestly, I think they should go a step further because George's son, Danny Harrison's a guitar player and Ringo's son, son Zach, is a drummer. Just do a whole oh, Beatles. Can't yeah, do it. but then Why it's like, can't they do that? Oh, Why then can't they, they do could. it? No, then but it's the like pressure. a tribute band. I think then it's like no, a No, they write new songs no, and do new stuff, but it's just the four of them. It's just like this, but have all four of them. This is Donnie ATV, probably from Chicago, Illinois. Uh, I kind of agree with both you guys. I feel like um, it's a great song. Um, it is a good idea to maybe start a uh, Beatles 2.0. I don't know how good it would be, 
Um, but they definitely got the potential because it's in the, the bloodline, first of all, and it'd be good for the culture to start a, a 2.0 Beatles because I think that was like maybe, what, 60 years ago? Uh, so it would be nice. I don't know how far it would go, but I think it would go pretty far as the Beatles. Was it 60 you know? years ago It today? was 60 years ago. When I, I, Sergeant Pepper taught the band to play? Would you stop? <laughs> when I see the picture of them there on the, on the jetway, I just, I think back to when I was 13. And I have such good memories about that. I know. That was a long time. It was a long time ago. <laughs> uh, what else do you guys want to talk about? Hey, it's Becca Berger from Warwick, Rhode Island. I'm here to talk about this producer and what she said about Sydney Sweeney calling her not pretty and not talented. I think we can all agree, men, women, people, we're all attracted to Sydney Sweeney. Unfortunately, I agree with her when it comes to the movie she was talking about. However, I mean, Sydney has Euphoria and a ton of other movies that she's in right now. She's the hot girl. White Lotus. In she was in White, White Lotus. Lotus. But she was also in Madam Web. Yeah, there you go. I'm not saying that's her you fault. You take the good, you take the bad, you take <laughs> I'm the both. Saying that's, I'm not putting it all on her. One more. Hi, it's Desiree Jackson from Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and I'm talking about Bill Mayer, and I think that, that he's a little bit biased in his comment. We have no idea what happens um, in someone's closed door, so we can't give our, our opinions about it. And honestly, who who puts it past someone that would be with their adopted child? It's kind of weird. Well, I will say what Bill was saying is you're right. We don't know what happens in closed doors, but there was there were two investigations, and those investigations they cleared them. That's what investigations are for: is to find out what happened behind closed. And doors. by the way, people jumping to uh, judgments. <laughs> That happens all the time now. I mean, that happens <laughs> all the time. We gotta take a break. All right, when we come back, Kanye at Disneyland? Not with the kids, he took the wife. <laughs> Which is always an adventure when you gotta worry about what she's wearing or not wearing. Listen, the, the Kardashians use Disneyland as sort of like their personal playground. They go all the time. True. Um, and so when we heard- But they go with kids. Well, they go with the kids, and so when we heard that Kanye and Bianca, his new wife, were at Disney. We figured out oh, they went the with the kids. Kids will be in tow, whatever. Yeah. Nope. 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 Just husband and wife He's... going to Star Wars land. As uh, Bianca goes, um, she's kind of demure this time. Yeah, I think even the uh, Disney cops would have had. Although, to say look at her about... feet. It's like she's got tape on her feet. It's like a. It's like she's yeah. barefoot. It's very uh, uh, Jedi. Uh, it's, give, it's giving Jedi. Dude, as the kids. Uh, uh, walking on that ground in Disneyland with your toes exposed that way. It's dangerous. I don't know. I mean, the other outfits, down with. What's the toes? Nose. <laughs> I know which one you're going to choose. Flying on a plane with no shoes or walking through Disney with no shoes? A plane, for you, sure. But you go to the restroom on the plane without putting on No, I shoes. don't. I don't. I have done it with socks. Well, that's a whole other story. <laughs> See you tomorrow.